Need highly configurable guns for your game? In this series, we're going to learn how we can implement from scratch a scriptable object, highly customizable gun system for your game. We're gonna have things like hitscan guns, projectile guns, reloading, bullet spread, attachments, damage effects, and much more all in this series. All of this is gonna be scriptable object driven so you don't have to make code changes and it's very easy to add new guns. Hey, Chris here from Mom Academy, here to help you. Who, me? Yes, you. Make your game dev dreams become a reality by making a highly configurable gun system for your game. Let me give you just the quick and dirty what are we gonna do in this video so that way you can use the chapters at the bottom to find the relevant sections for you. We're gonna implement hitscan guns specifically today. We're gonna to define three different scriptable objects. One, that's a shoot configuration. That'll define how should the gun shoot. That includes some simplistic bullet spread, rate of fire, that kind of stuff. We're gonna define a bullet trail config, which is going to configure the trail renderer. And then we're gonna define that gun scriptable object, which will define things that are specific to the gun, like the gun type, the gun name, have references to those other two scriptable objects, the model, where the model should be spawned into the world. And it's also going to actually handle the shooting effect. So that way we don't have to do that anywhere else in our code, only in that scriptable object. We can also have a player gun selector, which will allow us to choose which gun we want to use. And we're going to implement also simple left click to shoot in this video. Remember that this is the first video in the series. So everything I just said, we are going to implement today. Everything I said at the very beginning of the intro will be some of that will be in subsequent videos. So make sure you're subscribed so that way you get notified of whenever the new videos come out. And just before we go into the actual code, I wanna talk about why are we gonna use scriptable objects versus using a prefab based workflow. For advanced developers, this allows us to very easily externalize our configurations for all of these guns into like addressable, something like that. So that way we don't have to push a whole new build into our platform. Google Play, Apple Store, whatever. And also helps us keep our configurations consistent. We can reuse configurations if we want like bullet trails to be the same for a category of guns. We can just reuse the same scriptable object and attach that to all the guns, very convenient. It also allows us to have these configurations defined in a scriptable object instead of having like a static class where you just define new attachment and then have a list of attachments and attach all of those to a gun. And then anytime you wanna change how something's configured, you have to rebuild that's really frustrating and time consuming. Enough talking, let's jump into the code and see how we can get this done. We're gonna hop right into the code today, starting with the gun type class. We're gonna change that to an enum that does not extend mono behavior. And today we're only gonna implement two guns, a Glock and an M4A1. Anytime that we add new guns, we'll add a new entry here for that particular gun. Next, let's take a look at the shoot configuration scriptable object. We'll change it to extend a scriptable object and add a create asset menu attribute with a file name of shoot config and a menu name of guns slash shoot configuration. I'm gonna pick an order of two for this one. All that does is change where in the list it's gonna show up. We're putting anything to do with how the gun shoots into this class. So that's like the hit mask, meaning the layer mask that we want to raycast on, a vector three spread about how far from straight forward we will potentially shoot. This is our simplistic way of adding in bullet spread and a fire rate that will set to 0.25 by default. That'll be the delay between bullets. Next up is the trail configuration scriptable object. We will again make that extend the scriptable object and add the create asset menu with a file name of trail config. And again, a menu name of guns slash trail configuration. I'll put an order of four this time. And this one will have everything to do with how do we show that bullet trail or the bullet tracer? So a lot of this will be repeats of what you will see on the trail renderer, such as which material are we going to use? What is the width curve that we're going to use? What's the duration that it should have the trail displayed for? What's the minimum vertex distance? What's the color gradient? You can add more here, but I think that covers most of our common properties for a trail renderer. We're also going to add a mist distance and a simulation speed. The miss distance is how far we're going to shoot off into the distance whenever we miss with the raycast hit. Simulation speed is going to be how quickly we move this trail render from the gun's point to the hit point or to the miss location in units per second, which by default in Unity is meters per second. Next up is the gun scriptable object, where again, we will make it extend a scriptable object and add a create asset menu with a file name of gun and a menu name of guns slash gun. And we'll make this order zero. So it'll be at the very top. In here, we're going to find things that are strictly related to the gun itself. And we're going to abstract out all the extra configurations like the shoot configuration, trail configuration, 
mentioned in the future, we'll talk about also having like damage configuration, sound configuration, and some other stuff. We'll add a gun type called type. We'll add a name for the gun, a model prefab, the spawn point, and that should be in local coordinates, and the spawn rotation, which should also be in local coordinates. We'll add a reference to a shoot configuration and a trail configuration. And then we're going to make some private internal variables. And some of this might seem a little bit weird, but I promise it's going to make more sense once we get there. We're going to have a private mono behavior, active mono behavior, a private game object model. That's going to be the instantiated model, a float last shoot time, a particle system shoot system, and a private object pool. This is using the Unity 2021 object pool. So it's going to be an object pool of trail renderers, and we're going to call it trail pool. If you don't know how the Unity 2021 object pooling works, I've got a link in the description and a card on the screen to a video where I go in depth over everything about the Unity 2021 object pooling system. What we're gonna now do is define what functions do we need on the gun's scriptable object. The first one's gonna be a public void spawn that accepts a transform parent and a mono behavior, active mono behavior. We're gonna set this active mono behavior to be the active mono behavior that's passed in. We're gonna set the last shoot time to zero because if you are messing with scriptable objects in the editor, they are mutated in play mode and they're not reset. Whenever you do it in a build, it will properly reset. We'll create a new object pool of trail renders and pass in create trail and we'll get into that in just a second. We're gonna actually instantiate that model, set the parent and then set the local position and local rotation. Finally, we're gonna set the shoot system to be model.getComponentChildren, the particle system. So that means that our model must have a particle system active as a child. And we'll get a little bit more into that after we get through all of the coding section. Let's go ahead and define that create trail. So that'll be a private trail render create trail. And this is called anytime that we need to get a new object from the pool and we don't have one available. So we're gonna create a new game object called bullet trail. We're going to attach a trail render to it. And then we're gonna set all of those fields that we got from the scriptable object of trail config. That's the color gradient, the material, the width curve, the time, the min vertex distance. All that comes from the scriptable object. We're gonna set the emitting to be false and we're gonna set the shadow casting mode to be off. If you want that to be configurable, you can also define the shadow casting mode on the trail config scriptable object. Then we'll return that trail. We'll get into why we don't want it to be emitting once we actually spawn the trail. Now, the most critical thing that a gun needs to do is shoot. So we'll define a public void shoot and we'll check if time.time .time is greater than the shoot config fire rate plus the last shoot time. We're gonna play that shoot system. And one critically important thing that I always forget to do is to assign the last shoot time to be time.time. .time. I'm gonna come back and do that in a little bit, but if you're following along, make Make sure you say last shoot time equals time dot time right here. We're going to define a vector three shoot direction to be the shooting system forward plus a new vector three. And we're just going to pick a random range between the shoot config spread. So on the X, Y and Z, we're going to go from negative X, Y and Z respectively. And then we're going to do shoot direction dot normalize. And that gives us a shoot direction of length one. So it's actually a direction vector. And then we're going to do a ray cast from the shoot system transform position. So this particle system should be positioned at the tip of the gun where you want the bullets to spawn from. It should also be positioned where the forward is directly pointing out from the gun's barrel. That's how we're implementing it here. There's a bunch of different ways you can handle that. For me, it just makes sense for where you have that shooting particle system to be where we're actually ray casting from. We could also define on the shoot config a max ray cast distance if you want. Wanted. Float max value is the default value that comes in on a normal raycast, so that's why we're using it here. If that returns true, that means we did hit something. So what we're going to do, and here's why we need that active mono behavior, is active mono behavior dot start coroutine, and then we're going to say play trail, passing in the shoot system, transform position, the hit point, and the raycast hit, which again might seem a little bit weird, but I'm going to get into why do we need both of those in a second. If the raycast misses, then again we're going to do active mono behavior start coroutine because we still want to shoot something, or at least pretend like we're shooting something, playing the trail for from the shoot system transform position to the shoot system transform position plus the shoot direction times the trail config miss distance. So we're gonna start from the tip of the gun and go out in the direction of the shoot direction times however far we said that miss distance was. So we'll animate out 100 units and we'll pass out a new raycast hit as the final argument. Now let's define that play trail. That's private IE numerator play trail that accepts a vector three start point, a vector three end point, and a raycast hit hit. Raycast hit being a struct means we can't pass null there. So what we're going to do in here is trail render instance equal trail pool dot git. So we're going to get an instance of the trail render. We're going to set it to be active and we're going to set the transform position to be the start point. 
Then we're going to wait a frame because sometimes if you don't do this waiting and you immediately set the next line instance dot emitting equals true, you'll get a little bit of residual from the last point that that trail render was used at as it's coming back to that initial start point. So if we wait a frame before we enable the instance emitting again, that usually clears that up for us. Then we're going to do a fixed speed lerp from our start point to our end point using the trail config dot simulation speed as how fast we're going to move. We're doing a vector three lerp going from the start point to the end point where the fixed speed comes in by we're subtracting out the remaining distance minus the simulation speed times time dot delta time and dividing that by the total distance. That gives us a constant speed lerp which is generally how we want a bullet to appear. If this doesn't make sense, I go into it in more detail in the Lerping Fundamentals video. I've got a card on the screen and a link in the description to that as well. Once we've got the remaining distance to be less than or equal to zero, we're gonna set that trail render position to be exactly at the end point. We're gonna yield return by wait for seconds for the trail config dot duration. We're gonna wait one extra frame. And then we're gonna set emitting to be false and set the game object active to be false. I put true, we're gonna fix it, I'm sorry. After we've disabled this game object, then we're going to release that from the trail pool. What we've done here then is encapsulated all of the gun logic into scriptable objects. We don't need a mono behavior for a gun because all of it's defined at the scriptable object level. The scriptable object even handles the animating of the trail render and managing the object pool. So that's really cool because we need some kind of way for the player to shoot the gun, we can attach the coroutines that we need for the gun animation stuff to what we're going to call is the player action, which is going to handle the user input. We have relatively good design here encapsulating out all of our gun logic away from the player action where the player action only needs to know, hey, I want to shoot this thing. And the player action doesn't need to know anything about the gun other than that it exists and that it can shoot. One last thing I'm going to add in here just for a little bit of visual flair is using the surface manager because you'll notice we actually didn't use a raycast hit yet. After the trail has reached that end point, if it's made contact, we're going to check if hit.collider does not equal to null, meaning it actually hit something. We didn't just pass in new raycast hit. I'm going to do surface manager.instance.handle impact, passing in the hit transform game object, the end point, the hit normal, and then an impact type, and the final argument being zero. And at the very top of this script, I'm going to put a public impact type called impact type. This is how we can handle making contact with something and playing different effects such as bullet impact particle systems, bullet impact sounds, this kind of stuff. I have a video about how the surface manager works, so I don't want to go into it in this series. Again, link in the description, card on the screen for how this works. We just define an impact type, which we're going to define one as bullet impact, and then the surface manager handles everything else for us. We don't have to know anything else about it. I want to give a huge shout out to all of my Patreon supporters. Every one of you is helping this channel grow, reach more people, and add value to more people. And that means more people are making their game development dreams become a reality. If you want to show your support, you can go to patreon.com slash Academy, get your name up here on the screen, and get a voice shout out starting at the awesome tier. At the phenomenal tier level, there's Andrew Bowen. And at the awesome tier, there's Gerald Anderson, Autumn K, Matt Parkin, Ivan, Paul Berry, and Rulin. Thank you all for your support. I am so grateful. Let's move on to the player gun selector. So this is a mono behavior where we're going to pick which gun scriptable object that we're going to use. We'll start by adding serialized private gun type gun, a transform gun parent, a list of gun scriptable object guns, and a player IK that I'm calling inverse kinematics. And finally, a am going to put a space in a header that's titled runtime build in a public gun scriptable object active gun. The gun parent is going to be which transform are we going to parent the gun under? So remember on gun scriptable objects, we want to know which parent we're going to go under. I'm not going to go into the inverse kinematics in the scope of this one. I want to actually talk to you about it before we go through that. I'm not going to make this video too long. So don't worry about the inverse kinematics for today. We're going to get to it in a future video in the series. We want a public gun scriptable object called active gun. So we know which gun scriptable object should we actually use when we're trying to shoot. On start, we're going to find which gun is equal to our gun type. And here you probably wouldn't actually want gun type to be a serialized field on this script. You'd probably want to load it from player prefs or your player singleton about which gun do they have equipped or chosen to equip. We don't have all of that infrastructure in this repository today. So we're just serializing it on this class to simulate that. If the gun 
is null, we're going to log an error and return saying that we didn't find that gun type. That means that we have a misconfiguration. So if the gun is not null, we'll set the active gun to be that, and then we're going to spawn that gun. And then at the bottom, I'm doing some magic with the inverse kinematics. Again, please don't worry about this. We're going to cover inverse kinematics in a future video in this series. Finally, because we only want one of these on our player, we're going to add a disallow multiple component attribute at the top of this class. Now we're going to head over to the player action. Again, we only want one of these, so we're going to say disallow multiple component. We're going to serialize a reference to a player gun selector, that gun selector we just did. And an update, what we're going to do is check if the mouse left button is pressed and the gun selector active gun does not equal to all. Then we're we're going to try to shoot that gun. That's all that we need to do here. I'm using the new input system. If you're using the old input system, you can just do input dot get mouse button zero, and that'll give you the same thing here. I'm not using the input actions and all of that because we're really doing very simple things here. We're just checking for the left mouse button. So this is like the easiest way to get up and running where we can detect if you held the mouse button or if you just left clicked it for one frame, we're going to catch this either way. If we open up the Unity editor, let's make our scriptable objects. Because we use the create asset menu attribute, we we can right click create and we'll see all those options available with guns then underneath the guns menu we have gun shoot configuration and gun trail config these are in the order that we specified as that order attribute where the lower number is on top and I'm just going to make all the scriptable objects and we're going to fill them out. So in the trail folder I'll make the Glock trail config and the M4A1 trail config. And in the shoot folder, I'll make the Glock shoot configuration and the M4A1 shoot configuration. You'll notice that in the assets folder, I have structured a guns folder, then the shoot and the trail to keep everything organized. Now let's walk through the process of setting up each gun. For the Glock, the type of the Glock should be Glock. I'm going to set the name to also be Glock. For the model, these models come from Kenny, who offers a large number of free 3D models over at Kenny.nl. These are licensed under Creative Commons license, so I have included them in this repository. You'll notice that the pistol and the M4 are really the only prefabs that we're using here that are not effect-based prefabs. And there's also not a lot in this model prefab. It's just the model and the particle system for shooting. There's nothing, no scripts attached, no nothing. We need to attach this pistol to some point on the human body. So we're going to attach it underneath the right shoulder. My person's going to be right-handed. So if I parent the pistol underneath the right shoulder, you'll see that I've already spent a little bit of time to set it up so it's properly aligned here. And that's baked into the prefab. So it's spawning more or less where I want it to be. So these values that we have for position and rotation are the exact same values we're going to set up in the gun scriptable object. That would be how I recommend that you get these values as you position them yourself when you're setting it up where it should go, and then just use those values in the scriptable object. Then for the shoot and trail configuration, we can just add these references for the Glock shoot and trail configurations. We'll go ahead and remove that pistol from the hierarchy, unlock our inspector, and select the Glock shoot config. The hit mask will set up to be default, floor, and enemy, because those are the only ones that really make sense for us to hit. For the spread, we'll put something small like 0.03. Remember that this should be half of the total spread that you want it to be. Since we go from negative, whatever number we put here, to positive, whatever we put here on each axis. Since it's a pistol, I'm going to give it a relatively low fire rate of 0.25. That's four bullets a second. And then we'll move on to the trail config where first we need a material that we'll use. For this, I'm using a hot trail material that I created that's just a very simple trail with a gradient on it. This is also included in the repository. For the width curve, this is the width curve that's going to apply to our trail renderer, so we want it to be very small. I'll use 0.05 and have it go down to zero over the full duration. And I'll set the miss distance and simulation speed to be 50 instead of 100. 0.2 is probably too long of a duration. We're gonna change that in a little bit. I wanna show you why it's important to set this to be a very low value for most guns. We'll make the color be a gradient that fades out over time. With the Glock trail config done, let's go ahead and set the M4A1. It's going to be basically the same thing. And if we leave the duration at 0.5, you'll again see that this is not a good value. For the M4A1 shoot config, we're going to do basically the same thing, but we're going to make it fire much faster and have a little bit more spread. Again, we'll set the M4A1 to have the M4A1 type. 
We'll call it an assault rifle and we'll choose our, it's called the machine gun from Kenny. So we'll choose that model, which if we set up underneath the right shoulder, we'll see I haven't set this one up properly yet. So if I do a little fast forward in time, you can see me positioning it where it looks kind of okay. And then I'm gonna copy those values into the M4A1 gun scriptable object. And we'll hook up those trail configs and shoot configs the last things that we need to set up are those player gun selector and player action. For the player gun selector, we'll start with the Glock. So we'll leave the gun as Glock. We'll set the gun parent to be that right shoulder that we just positioned everything under. We'll drag the gun scriptable objects to the guns. Hook up the inverse kinematics. And for the player action, we'll drag the gun selector script to that reference there. If we click play, we'll see that our Glock has very large trails. So that's where we need to reduce that trail time, but we get the impact effects. And when I'm left clicking, we are properly shooting. If we lower the Glock trail config to have a duration of 0.05 instead of the 0.2 we had before, we'll see that it looks a lot nicer. Since we are using an object pool and we're only configuring trail render one time when we first make the object, we have to restart the game if we want the scriptable object changes to apply. If I just change the player gun selector to use the gun M4A1 and restart, we'll see the new gun spawns into the scene. And if I left click, we shoot a whole bunch of bullets because there's a very short delay between bullets. Again, here we set the duration of the trail to be 0.5. So I'm going to lower that to 0.1, restart the game and see that it looks again, a lot better than it was before. We'll also notice that these bullets move significantly faster because the simulation speed here is twice as fast. Regardless, if we hit something or miss, the bullets are flying around and look pretty good. We'll stop here for today. This gets us the ability to create new guns, create new shoot configurations, create new trail configurations, actually shoot those guns where the gun scriptable object is that main workhorse for how are we doing all of our logic. There are two things I want to talk about before we close out this video for maybe someone who's more advanced and you're going to build on top of this before you check out the next video or before I release the next video. So number one is we're using a gun type enum to check for which gun should we select, right? That's probably not ideal, especially if you're talking about, I want to add guns dynamically, then you need to also update this gun type enum, do a new build, all that kind of stuff. Instead of doing that, you can do name matching on the guns and say whenever the player gun selector has used the Glock and have that as a string that's matched, then you check against the name of all of the available scriptable objects and see, hey, is this the gun I need to equip? Okay, that's the one. Let's use that one instead. I generally don't like to use magic strings like this, but if you have an unknown number of guns, it's kind of the only option, at least as far as I can tell. Number two is we're hard linking all the scriptable objects that player gun selector in the inspector. Most likely, again, if you're using addressables and looking into the future, that's not gonna work very well for you because you're gonna wanna dynamically add new ones. If we put all of these gun scriptable objects in the resources folder and then in the player gun selector on a lake or something, if we do resources.load all, that would give us all of our gun scriptable objects and all the also associated trail configs, that kind of stuff. And then in the future, if you want to use addressables or something like that to pull in more, you can just load the addressable and then combine the two lists. If you got value out of this video or you're looking forward to some of those future topics we're going to cover in this series, go ahead and like and subscribe to stay up to date the latest tutorials. New videos are posted every tutorial Tuesday, and I'll see you next week.